evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I have prepared some things to talk about, and I'll talk a little bit about myself, my background, I guess, and how I've, I guess, fallen in love with doing art. And also then, there's going to be some chance for everybody here, if they wish to, I'm not forcing anyone to, but to participate with some found objects as I step you through how I process things through, I guess, as a found object artist. So, yeah, up to you if you want to be a part of it or not. Um, as just some of the, I suppose, things that have influenced me over my life. As a young girl, I was always picking up things. Didn't matter where I went, the beach, the country, shops, anywhere. I just pick up things and have a big haul to take back to the car. I'm the eldest of uh, four siblings, well, three siblings, I'm number four. And my dad used to go, oh, you can't bring those shells, rocks and bits of seaweed back into the boot. And I'd go, oh, and then mum would go, we'll squish them in for you, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so she'd always help me out there. So just being a collector and being a bowerbird way back then. I was called Bright Eyes at that time because I'd always find things and find things that were lost as well. So that was kind of a, a good plus for me. Because my parents are both quite creative, Dad's uh, an engineer and Mum, well, she <clears throat> ran a shop for years. She was more of an at-home mum. And, um, but she did run a shop for years. But she's very creative in her knitting and in her sewing. So as a young girl growing up in Melbourne, which is very cold and rains a lot, the um, useful box that my mum always had up in the hall cupboard always came in useful. So when it rained, it came down, a big box full of fabrics, crayons, just bits and pieces really, sort of a bits and pieces box. So I was always making collages when I was a young girl. Then there was my grandparents, especially on my mum's side, her parents. So grandpa had a shed. So this shed was just not a very big shed. It was probably only about a quarter of this room. But in that shed, there was tools and there was bits of metal and bits of string and stuff. And if you went to visit grandma and grandpa and you needed something like, oh, I'd like to do some painting. We don't have a paintbrush. Okay, says grandpa. So into the shed he goes and into the shed I'd trundle gets a bit of flat metal, some hair from a horse hair uh, sofa and makes me a paintbrush, sort of a flat handle, it's gorgeous paintbrush. Made me cricket stumps and a cricket back so I wanted to play cricket. So grandpa could always make things and he always had things in his shed. So it was kind of like an Aladdin's cave for me and it smelt good, kind of oily but dusty but you know, sawdusty and everything. So I guess that sort of was in my veins already. Grandma was a great gardener. I don't say I'm a great gardener. I do like getting into the garden and I think most creative people quite like gardening, most. <laughs> uh, the other influences that I've had is when I was in primary school, right from prep, they called it the bubs when you were in Victoria. Uh, so I'm probably about five, I guess. My first teacher, Mrs. Robotham, still remember the name, such a different name. She saw one of my drawings and just said to me, Peter, you're going to grow up and do something really creative. I'm like, mm, okay. So I don't know. Did she put that suggestion in my head and thus I followed that? Or was I already creative, but probably just like every five-year-old is? Because I think that most young people are very creative in what they do. The way they draw until they get to a certain age where they start to be... Uh, more down on what they're doing and more comparing what they do with other people's of what they do. So who knows? But that might have been the thing that sort of led me towards doing things a little bit creatively. Um, of course, I always got excited when school would give me a project to do. Like everyone's got a project, here's your piece of project paper and you've got to do it on this topic. So that used to be a very exciting thing for me to do and I used to not just draw but obviously do text, but also collage. And I think that was a little different to some of the other kids who maybe just did some drawings. So I guess that's where that background comes from. Then as I got older, I only, I left school in form four, which is about a year 10 level, I think, here. And because I was failing at maths, but I was doing well in everything else. <laughs> Great in art too, of course, and English and things like that. 
But my dad, as I might have mentioned before, he's an engineer and he had his own business and he said, oh, you failed at maths and, you know, women aren't doing anything, you know, you're just going to get married and have kids. And this was his sort of old-fashioned way of thinking. So you can come and work for me and my business and do maths. <laughs> so that's what I got to do. So I became a draftswoman and surveyor. And I really did enjoy that because it wasn't always in the office. It was out sometimes in the paddocks with the cows and, you know, with the staff and doing all that sort of stuff. Then coming back into the office and plotting the plans up. And I'm quite a neat handwriter and I got even better because when you're a tracer and you're doing plans that councils have to read, everything has to be pretty neat. So that probably also, I guess, gave me another sort of feather to, towards what I like to do. I am a Virgo and I do like to do things in a Virgo way, I say sometimes, but other times really I'm quite messy. Things don't, don't have to be perfect. And I think that's why found object art <laughs> absolutely appeals to me. So now I'm going to talk about found objects. I do, I'll just quickly talk about other things. You're probably seeing some slides up there. I do collage as well, which I think is a little like found object art, except mainly working more <laughs> flat. But where you have to, to pile of papers or you, um, whatever you're going to use in your collage, where you are looking at how things work together. You're auditioning things before you put them down and a little bit like that with found object art too. There is some auditioning going on with the objects and what they're going to create. There's more than just auditioning, I find, with found objects. So found objects, probably being the bowerbird, I already had a big collection of things. And once I started to realise that this could be an art form, I started to really um, collect more objects. <laughs> it's my excuse anyway. And put them together in um, an assemblage or assemblages. I brought a few in so you can see them more in the three-dimensional. Uh, I don't work with always new things. So the two white ones there are iPad boxes that I've covered in foam core and then covered as well in rice papers. Uh, this is a found box on this side here and the other one's a cigar box. Um, there's boxes that cutlery come in, boxes that glasses come in. So any sort of a box or vessel form um, is fair game for me to put things into. Nothing has to be new. I sometimes create my own boxes as well. So there's a box over here that has a lid on it that's all created from bookboard. And the lid itself is actually a collagraph that I had printed several times for a CPI a printmaker's exhibition. And it was just too good to not use as something. And since the box was about crocodiles, that became the lid for the box. So creating a box is something that I quite like to do, but finding a box to put things in is also something that I really like to do. So what I was going to say too is because I went to TAFE and I loved that. I was so lucky to go and do a diploma at TAFE. I, you know, I think other people here have definitely gone to TAFE or maybe done a course at TAFE. So if you get a chance to do it because they're great down there. What I learnt there was printmaking and painting and I passed them both quite well, but I just didn't love painting, so printmaking was more the process that I really liked. But from there, where you had to learn the technique of it, um, be able to produce an addition, so the print's the same, the same, the same, I think we had to do six the same to be able to pass. Um, I got bored with just printing the same plate, and also I'm not that famous, so there's not that many people wanting my prints. So for me it was like, fine, print lots of prints with one plate because it's a bit wasteful to just make a plate and only print one print. But do other things to that print, so add stitch or add collage, in collé, print in different colours, I mean hand colouring. These are all things that people do. But put found objects onto the print. <laughs> Why not make it three dimensional? Why just keep it as a flat print? And, you know, muck around with things. Be a bit experimental if you can be. So I guess that's where I tended to sort of go down that track with my printmaking. Since working with found objects, printmaking, I've also begun work with textiles. And that seems to have been the last 
couple of years nearly now, I think, I've been developing a lot of textile work. Now, this is nothing perfect. Um, I don't want it to be perfect, actually, so we're not talking about cutting things in the um, patterns or quilt making, which I admire, but am not going to do. I'll leave that to other people. It's really putting things together that are, once again, almost found fabrics, found textiles. Some new, but some died, some rusted, um, more destroyed or buried in the garden. I've been known to do that as well and let things eat it. So that's been my passion more of late, I guess, is developing textile works. That probably came a little bit from some workshops that I did with a couple of textile artists. So Yetta Clover, who's somebody that I really admire. And that's spelled J-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E. Clover just Clover. She's an artist from Belgium. And there's also Kaz Holmes, who is an artist in the United Kingdom. So I've done some workshops with both of them. They're fabulous artists and fabulous ladies who do sometimes quite large works, especially yet. She does very large works for the wall, um, Kaz, perhaps smaller ones than Yetta. So the way they combine their textiles and what they do to them, which is printing on them um, and stitching, obviously, overlaying different things, which is what I like as well. So that really appealed to me. So that's where things have sort of, you know, I've gone down that track a little bit more. I find even being now a full-time artist and, you know, sometimes being able to run workshops, I still don't have enough time to do everything. I don't know how I did anything before and I don't know how anybody that works does anything now. And I know you all do though. You're all really good at it. But um, yeah, it's just, uh, there's so much to do and so much to learn. It's very exciting. Encaustic is another um, technique that I really enjoy. And talking about these techniques separately, they can also come together and they often do in my work. So everyone's familiar with encaustic or, yep. So I did bring one in there, the one in the box here is an encaustic work. Feel free to have a feel. Um, once again, combined it with found objects and, and stuff. And it's on, it's either on bookboard that one or it's on mat board but you can do it on actual timber board as well. So encaustic is a beautiful technique because once again, you can layer things, something that I enjoy. I'm not a painter in encaustic. There are people who paint with encaustic and so they have coloured encaustic pans just like people who paint with acrylics or oils have. And I'm just not into that. If I'm going to colour anything, I'm going to use pan pastels or oil colour rubbed on and I'm going to incise in. So I guess that's just more my style, as it is other people's as well. I also like working with plaster and encaustic. Plaster takes encaustic so beautifully, and it's nice to work three-dimensionally and decide if your container holds things or doesn't hold things, is, in, is an empty space. Okay, so the other thing that I really like to do is artist books. So I bought a couple of them in as well. A lot of things can be called an artist book, so that one's more of a book book. You can see it's got a spine, it's got pages that open out. This one's a concertina one that opens out. This can be called an artist book as well because it also can be read opening out, but also an artist book. An artist could develop something that just hung on a wall and they could say that is an artist book because it has some sort of a narrative in it. So once again, it depends on how you want to define an artwork and your reasoning for for making it. I like artist books. I usually only make unique ones. As a printmaker, I could print, you know, an edition of an artist book if I wanted to. But yeah, I don't choose to do that for the same reasons as I didn't want to edition um, my, my prints, my 2D prints either. So I like the uniqueness of a one-off type of book. Having said that, I've made, say, a lot of artist books in a, com a series of works that I did called the Crocodile Series. And I just got mad about crocodiles <laughs> and <laughs> made lots of different books and stories about crocodiles. So, yeah, they're all one-off books, so no two are the same. I like to work in a series, talking about series. So, of late, I've worked in series to do with memory, memory loss. My mum has Alzheimer's, so that seems to be a topical thing for me and I guess sometimes it's working through those sorts of things within yourself, but also learning more about the uh, issues surrounding 
at least Alzheimer's memory loss, there's a lots of different types of memory loss as we all know, but also my work has always been about a narrative of something. And a lot of people look at my work and say it's, it's sort of memorabilia, you know, it's, it's kind of nostalgia, you know, it's sort of that kind of thing. I suppose in a way, I don't think it's just nostalgic work that I do. I think it has deeper meaning than just that. Um, yeah, but it does have story, it does have narrative and people do as well. My second job after working for about 10 years for my dad as a draftswoman and surveyor was working with people, so a counsellor, so personal counsellor and working in schools with young people and you know, adults as well. And so I suppose people have always been very much a part of my life and their stories are amazing and people are amazing what they, what they get through, you know, the things that, that affect them and how people get through it. I believe art is a very great way of helping us all stay healthy, mentally healthy, or if we do need to become more mentally healthy to work through things, I think that's a really great thing to do. And I'm sure you all know that whatever art form it is, whether it's movement art form or singing art form or visual art form, everything's that creation is great. Through a little bit about how my process goes with my found objects. So I thought what better way to do it than to see if people would like to do something with some found objects. Okay, so you get to do a little bit of a play with the found objects and I'll invite you to maybe talk a little bit about how you're seeing what you're doing with those found objects, how that relationship with the found objects is maybe bringing forth some sort of a story that you see. Being very aware that when I put my things together, I see a narrative in it, and then when Sally comes along and looks at it, she might see a completely different narrative in it. And that's great. Perfectly fine to have all that happening. And that's, that's the beauty of art, isn't it? And how everybody will interpret it. So the idea being, and you've got to have a lot of choice. I put a lot of things in because I didn't know how many people would be here. There could have been 20, so I thought, oh, I better bring plenty in. So what I'd like you to do, there's two tables of found objects. You can pretty well see those there. Is to cruise around, to spend a little bit of time and choose just two objects to start with. Now the way I do it is this. I get the stuff out that I think is going to work with the series I'm going to do. And I put them out on the tables and the floors and I have a big studio so I have a lot of space. And I do, I just, I, I cruise around, I just pick things up and some things I go to pick up and I, no, yes, yes, no, put you back. So there's different, like already a bit of auditioning happening and that's more from, I know it sounds weird and I'm hoping it doesn't sound too weird, but it's like the objects have some sort of a vibration or they've, they've got that energy in them. And because I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna put some things together that's going to tell stories about a photograph or a series of photographs that I've got. So that's what I want you to do, is just do that Pick the things up that appeal to you, that seem to give you that vibe. I know you don't have anything in mind at the moment as to what these, what you know, you could be putting these together as, but I'm just going to step you through the process as if, yeah, you're not putting anything together yet. But you can imagine you're maybe putting it in a box or some sort of a container. Does that sound okay? Just look at one of those objects. Let's concentrate on one. Does it have a story? Do you think it has a story in its past? Like what was it used for maybe? Where maybe has it been found? Where has it been? So does the story change when you put your objects together? Is anything, is there another story coming out? Often when I'm doing things, I like the objects, but then it's about what else, is there another bit in, in this that needs to happen to add to the story, but also to join it, because the other part of found object yeah. art is trying to get these things to assemble together in a way that they're not going to just you know fall apart the first time somebody touches yes. them. You can use glue, having learnt from this lovely artist called Keith Laboo. 
I call him no glue Lebu because he does not like glue. Um, but he does use something sometimes, some glue. But mostly he uses wire and drilling. Um, he makes his own little um, split pins. But I certainly do use wire and I certainly do drill. And I love wax, linen, thread. That's really, really lovely to, to join things with. Um, it also grabs really nicely and doesn't seem to like to let go so well as just normal string sometimes does. So, so that's the next thing that's the challenge, I suppose, for the found object artist. Once they've got the objects that seem to be telling the story together, it's like, okay, now how am I going to get this piece of glass to go onto this piece of pottery to this piece of wood, which is like, oh. <laughs> so We audition things and then sometimes, no, you aren't working anymore. Yeah. What you are saying with these other objects isn't yeah. helping my story happen yeah. here. <laughs> and you know, even though you might be putting something <laughs> in an assemblage, it doesn't necessarily have to be a box that has sides. It could be just a top and a bottom, so you can still see all the way around it. I mean, there's all sorts like of ways of, yeah, yeah, that's right, or something with very thin kind of stands that help hold, hold things up or give it a defined area or a nice piece of perspex that pops mm. over the top of it somehow. Mm. So that's the other part, of course, which is the display, I suppose, or how this piece is going to to look where it will go. Mm -hmm. yeah. The process of making art, any art, it doesn't really matter, is more the exciting part for me. I mean, obviously then it's good it's finished <laughs> and then it's good it goes maybe to an exhibition and maybe someone even buys it so that's even better. So, but the process of, of creating it to me is a very exciting part. I do like to see the finished product as well. And I think that there's always that excitement. If there isn't, I don't know, maybe I'll be sort of so old by then I won't mind, but... <laughs> I think it probably is the same for all of us. When we're, whatever we're doing, however we're creating, it's that process that we get excited by and, you know, wanting to get to a finished product. I mean, I don't really want to be, you know, just half making things everywhere. Yeah. But, um, yeah, completion is always good. But the process to me is important. So and there's always a challenge. It doesn't matter if you're putting together similar things. There's still a challenge as to how you put them together. But it's... It's a fun challenge, yeah.